is Jackie B. Peterson, your host today. I'm the author of Better, Smarter, Richer, Seven Business Principles for Solo and Creative Entrepreneurs. I'm a coach and a consultant and a teacher, and what I do is I help solopreneurs, those of you in one-person businesses, become more financially successful. I do that through my training courses. I've got three new courses up online, How to Charge What You Are Worth, How to Identify and Find Your Target Market, How to Establish Yourself as an Expert, all online at my website, bettersmarterrichard.com. Also do that through my book, Better, Smarter, Richer, which is a fill-in-the-blanks workbook. We run study groups around that book so that you don't have to work alone to fill it out and uh, find a cohort of like-minded folks who are going to help you through the challenges of changing your thinking towards the ideas that are going to help you be more financially successful. But we've also put that course up online at www.opensesame.com if you're not available to join one of our in-person study groups. I hope you'll go to the website, sign up for our newsletter, download the free ebook outlining the seven principles and what they mean to your business, and read the blog. Every week we have interesting conversations with other solopreneurs on the blog. They're very inspiring and will help you set your direction and stay on course to the financial success you deserve. So my guest today is Jake French. Jake is now 27. He's a 2008 forestry products graduate of the University of Idaho. However, that career and the future Jake envisioned were not to be. Jake suffered a severe trauma in December of 2008 that left him paralyzed from the collarbone down. Jake's journey from finding himself as a quadriplegic to where he is today, a successful, inspirational speaker and role model, is what we're going to talk about on the show today. I'm so glad you can be with me today, Jake. Hello. Good morning, Jackie. How are you today? I'm great. I'm just so glad you're going to be with us today. So tell our audience your story. It's a stunning story. Thank you. I'm one of the last person in the world who would ever think of themselves as being a solopreneur one day because four years ago, I had my life all planned out. I was going to be a forester. I had just graduated from the University of Idaho, received my degree in forest products, and was beginning my first permanent full-time job in tropical, steamy Tillamook, Oregon. (laughs) I was working for the Oregon Department of Forestry, and had only worked in that new position for about three weeks. But I was pumped. It was 2008. I had a job. Life was good, right? I went out to my old hometown of Eagle Creek, which is by Portland, Oregon. Old friends met new friends, and we were partying. It was a few of my friends' birthdays, and we just celebrated until the cows came home. And unfortunately, I still had that old college mentality of drink till you drop. That night was no different. We just drank way too much, and on our way home is where we ran into trouble. We stopped at a gas station. I'm going to guess at 2 o'clock in the morning. My friends got out to pay for the fuel. I'm in the back seat just looking at that gas station, and I see this person kind of stagger up. In my mind, I'm thinking, wow, that guy's really messed up. I can see him staggering. As he gets closer and closer, I think, oh, my gosh, he looks familiar. And, and then, oh, hey, I recognize him. It, just by chance, I happened to run into my childhood best friend, the kid I'd grown up next door to and was really my best friend for the first 13 years of my life. Scramble out of the pickup and we greet each other. Hey man, how's it going? It's so good to see you. It's been like five or six years. We're talking back and forth very excitedly for maybe one minute. And when I turn my back, he made a bad choice. And he decided to put me into a full Nelson headlock. I don't know why he did this. We weren't wrestling or fighting in any way. I just think he was trying to goof around and show how big and strong he was. Well, with both of us having our balances impaired by alcohol, we fell forward. And without the ability to stick my arms out and break the fall, the first thing to hit the pavement was my head. The weight of two bodies snapped my neck right away at the six vertebrae. And in just an instant, I mean, before you even have a chance to hit the reset button, um, I went from being on top of the world to laying on the pavement, looking up, able to move anything. Life changed like a light switch. I was awake for maybe 10 minutes. Paramedics showed up. uh, Then the life flight came, and that's where I passed out. 
and woke up at OHSU with the surgeon staring down at me, saying, Jake, you've just broken your neck. You're now quadriplegic. You'll never move your legs again. You will never move your arms again. And when we get done with this next surgery, we don't know if you'll ever be able to breathe on your own again. Oh, wow. Wow, Jake, that is quite a story. And so you did a, a long recovery from there, and you talk about your aha moment where you learn that attitude is the most important element of success. And can you talk a little bit about that huge awakening that you had? Sure. I challenged my audience today. I asked them, do you think that accident was a defining moment in my life? And the answer is yes, it was a defining moment. But I truly believe it was not the defining moment. For you and for me, it's not going to be about the things that happen to us, because they all do. I mean, every single one of us has to deal with something, and there is no scale of yours was worse or mine was worse. And It's what we choose to do next. And it was what happened next that really was the start uh, of a defining moment that really shaped the direction my life would take. I want to say it was day three. Still in the intensive care unit at OHSU, and everything was upside down. I mean, we're crying. Mom had to quit her job and to become a full-time caregiver. And I hit that point where I just couldn't take it anymore. So when she came in the room, her face was all red from crying. I strained over as hard as I could against that plastic neck brace. I said, Mom, would you just chill? <laughs> it is what it is. And if you can imagine a deer in the headlights, look, <laughs> both mom, my, my <laughs> brother, my dad, the nurses were like, do we just give him too many meds? What happened here? <laughs> <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I didn't start out with some noble intention, hear the trumpets blaring. <laughs> that was just a purely coincidental luck uh, reaction. It wasn't planned. But I'm well, looking I'm gonna back on that. somewhere in you. <laughs> Maybe, and I'm looking back on that, and that light bulb's starting to flicker and thinking, wait a minute, at that point in time, I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't move my hand even one inch. By choosing an attitude, by choosing a can-do positive attitude was powerful enough to move every single person in that room to find the strength to move on. And that's wow. really the basis of my book, Life Happens, Live It, of my speeches to schools and to professional uh, audiences at conferences is that choice. And we are not our circumstances. And part a lot of, of people, teaching, uh, Jake, have said that choosing our attitude is maybe the only choice we really have. And, um, yep. you know, because as you said, life happens and, you know, there's so many things that are outside of our control. And, you know, to say it again, we can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we react to it, and how we, you know, what we do about what happens to us. And choosing hey, that's, a positive that's a attitude. quote right from my book. I love it. Yeah. Choosing a positive attitude is just, it's kind of like ground zero. You know, it's, it colors absolutely everything that you do from there. Wow. So You're right on you, the money. You know, how, how do you, you know, this positive attitude is, I know what you're talking about. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that in your work, you know, the lectures and book and things. But how do you keep nourishing that within yourself? How do you, how do you keep that alive and, you know, make a choice every day to maintain that positive attitude? Do you have some little tips you can share with the rest of us? Absolutely. And part of these tips I, I didn't realize I was doing. Like, like I said, I did not start out I'm Mr. Righteous, Mr. Noble, follow me, family, we will get through this. <laughs> they were just, just reactions, and I look back now and have pulled out uh, those tidbits so that I can use them in my ongoing struggle every day and help audiences with, uh, with their personal struggles. And it was really my background, I think, as a country boy and a forester, an outdoorsman, being around those type of people, uh, farmers, foresters, loggers, that instilled a sense of practicality. I look at it this way, just on some of the facts of what happened. I had an accident. My neck was broke. That's a fact. You can't change the fact. Only 20% of my body were out. That's a fact. You can't change that. I can't do my old job and go to some of the old places. Again, can't change that. 
But what we do next with what I have, with what we have, and the opportunities, that is a choice. That is a choice that gives you and I so much power over our lives because it happens to us. I really think it's just a chapter in our book, but it doesn't have to be the end. You hold that yeah. pen. You can keep writing the chapter or you can start a whole new one. It's up to you. Wow. And certainly, you know, when you're talking about particularly from where you were coming, uh, making that choice to uh, take charge, to stay positive, to uh, look for paths and alternatives and, and ways to go was a huge um, dipping into or opening up of your own creativity and probably inspiring many, many people around you to also be creative to figure out how to make things work for you, um, you know, with only 20% of your body working, you know, because it wouldn't just be you being creative, but people around you have probably uh, tapped into their creativity in ways that they never thought they would do in order to bring forth the manifestation of this positive attitude. So, you know, I am so lucky to have the friends and family that are in my life. My mom is outrageous. I mean, she is miscreative. And my brother's the same way. This is what we have to work with. What can we do with it? Mm -hmm. uh, part of the exercises I do involves a total gym. And while I don't like anything like Chuck Norris, the guy who's selling them on TV, mm -hmm. <laughs> send it back. This doesn't work. <laughs> uh, yeah. <but laughs> uh, she has really helped me to take the words can't do out of my vocabulary. Because yeah. just like when we got the Total Jam, we're, we're setting it up thinking, oh, this will be a great way for me to get load-bearing uh, weight on my joints and, and get some range of motion. Well, we set it up, and I couldn't get into the room that we had stored in. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I spent the money on this, and this will never work, and da 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 and just throwing myself into the pity pit, it, never once thinking, well, what do we have to work with? Kind of that same question I had to ask when I woke up in the hospital. And so the creative side of mom rigged up this little chair with wheels that made a coffee table to bridge the gap and put these yoga mats down for grip and cushion. And I mean, it's quite the contraption, it's quite the show <laughs> to see how we go from, uh, you know, wheelchair to total gym. And looking at things with that can do. Uh, mentality, that can-do vision, only focusing on what you have to work with, that allows so many more possibilities to remain open in our lives. You know, so many people talk about that scene in that wonderful movie, Apollo 13, where, if you remember, the air filter was, it was round and it had to be square, or it was square and it had to be round, you know, in order to get oxygen to the astronauts as they were, you know, coming back to Earth, and they'd had this, you know, all these malfunctions on the on the capsule, you know, and they, and it's, this reminds me of your story, and they, they threw on a table all of the stuff that the astronauts had available to them to work with. You know, they had these pieces, this type of material, you know, this vent, this, you know, insulation, this stuff, you know, and they said, okay, design what we need to have. You've got, you know, half an hour or something, you know. <laughs> you know it sounds like the story with the coffee table and the, you know, the yoga mats and the, you know, we just used it and did it, right? Yep, and I'm the last person in the world who would ever say, well, just smile and have a positive attitude. Your life will be great. Everything will work out. <laughs> uh, if anything, I've had to overcome a lot of personal cynicism. Having that kind of tough guy background, four years ago, I would have laughed at the thought of an inspirational speaker or talking about feelings and emotions. <laughs> but seriously, I, I would have. I mean, <laughs> it never would have been confident enough to open up like that. And I, oh. I tell people, you know, having that smile and, and choosing that can-do attitude, it leaves doors open and allows people to come into your life and become supports. And, and these are doors and people you might not know have ever even existed and are willing to help you, but they're there. Isn't that true? You know, so what you're saying is that your your choice of a positive attitude um, moves you so that you see things 
that were standing there before, but you didn't see them before. And now, all of a sudden, there they are. You know, they come right into your vision. And not only do they come into your vision, but they, you know, they bring you resources and ideas and, you know, things that you needed at that moment. And they just show right up. It's a little bit like marketing in our businesses, isn't it? The efforts we put in, you can't always see immediate results. No. But if you don't put in that effort, you're guaranteed to fail because you didn't do anything. Right. But doing those free speeches, uh, all those blog posts, the wonderful blog posts that you do, the calls that you host, those um, over time create awareness and create followers, help establish credibility. And like I just had a person call me up that saw me give a free speech two years ago and book me for a conference two years out. It's one of those wow. things that you don't always see right off the bat. You know, this is this is going to make me money or this is going to leave doors open. But yeah. you're guaranteed to fail if you don't try. Yeah, you're guaranteed to fail if you don't try. That's a great message. That, that's really a great message. So how has being, you know, you talked about you never thought you'd see yourself as a solopreneur. I can understand that. So how has that um, made all the difference for you, this solopreneur it business has, you've got? It has opened up so many possibilities for me. There's no way I could do my old job as a forester. Unfortunately, the woods aren't handicap accessible, which is fine. Yeah. This has allowed me to work from home, have a lot more flexible hours. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the physical challenges I deal with uh, later in the show today. It, it has allowed me to compensate for that. And right now, I am in my room, on my side, on my bed, in a position that I have to be in to accommodate some of my challenges. And that wouldn't be possible if I just had a nine to five and had to go to an office. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it wouldn't at all. And and it also allows you to um, bring forth into the world and get paid for uh, that positive attitude and overcoming your your personal cynicism and tapping into your. Um, emotional side and being willing to talk about it. It also is a route to turn that, to monetize that attitude shift that you've done, which is pretty hard to do in a lot of nine-to-five jobs or not a lot of corporate jobs or government jobs like you had. Um, You know, they're so busy doing other things that they, you know, what has become meaningful to you would not be meaningful in that kind of work. People don't hire you to do that sort of work. And here in the solopreneur business, you can make a business being who you are. And there's never been a better time to embark on a career as a solopreneur as there is um, right now. I mean, we're living in the golden age because we have so many resources at our fingertips that in the past you maybe had to be part of a larger company to have access to the lists that we do and being able to go online and find a virtual assistant, for example, or use technology that is just standard issue now. Every teenager has uh, a phone which can, um, that's like the mystery gadget that we would have looked at 20 years ago saying, oh my gosh, if I only had that. Oh yeah, better than Dick Tracy's watch, you know, <laughs> have you ever read those funny, you know? Exactly. All these, all these science fiction things and... We've got better than, than those science fiction things were with the tools that we have. So talk about so what are some of the special challenges you have being a solopreneur that most of the rest of us never have to think about. Most of the challenges I have are based around my disability. And I'm a C6 quadriplegic, which means I broke a vertebrae in my neck. I'm essentially paralyzed from the collarbone down and can use about 50% of my arms so I can feel and use my shoulders, my rippling biceps. <laughs> okay, they're just biceps, maybe not rippling. <laughs> and I can feel like my uh, the tops of my forearms and then my thumb and my pointer finger on each hand. And I, I want to preface what I'm about to say with this. Anytime I talk about my disability or my challenges, I'm not embarrassed about it. I mean, it's I know I'm in a wheelchair, something i got to live with. People can ask me anything. And also, I don't ever say one thing to draw sympathy or pity. That's not what I'm about. Uh, We all have challenges. 
probably my biggest challenges come from logistics. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. You wouldn't think that my biggest uh, source of adversity does not come from the wheelchair that I sit in. It's actually from an invisible hurdle uh, that's dubbed post-spinal cord injury and neuro pain. Where I sit is basically just on fire. And it's ironic for a, a, a person that can't stand, I also cannot sit for very long. Uh -huh. I have to mitigate that with lots of exercise, switching positions, trying to be on my side, on my stomach, on my back, on my bed as much of the day, uh, being up in my standing frame, and then unfortunately a lot of pain medications, which are mm -hmm. such a double-edged sword, and, and many people can relate to that. You know, when I ask who has back pain, I bet half the audience raises their hand. Yeah. And they're great. I mean, they, they do reduce some pain, but the side effects are um, pretty hard to deal with at times. Yes. Wow. So, so just wow. lining up, you know, how am I going to organize my day? And the unfortunate reality is I, I just can't do everything. Mm -hmm. So I have to plan my day around how much sitting time I'm going to, uh, going to spend and I'm really confident, though, that in my lifetime, something will come about that helps restore a little bit more, um, whether it's function or pain tolerance. I, I'm very, very optimistic about the future. Yeah. Well, there's an awful lot of research work, I think, that's being done, you know, in that area, you know, to, to <clears throat> as you say, pain mitigation or to find ways to stimulate those nerves that... Uh, you know, your brain can't communicate with them anymore because of the break, you know, but they're, they're still there and find ways to stimulate them and get them moving. A lot of research done on that now. Yeah. And and it's fun that you do follow After that. After every single speech, someone or a couple people will come up to me and just tell me these amazing stories about the personal trials they have been through. I mean, almost unthinkable things with pain, with health, with money. And then I bet 90 those people will then discount what they have been through with this line. But it's nothing compared to what you are going through. Uh -huh. yeah. And I just say, oh my gosh, give yourself some credit. Whatever yeah. challenges you have are the biggest thing in your world at that moment, at that yeah. point in time. And they yeah. have every bit as much of a chance of derailing your plans or holding you back or making it hard to get out of bed in the morning that's what I'm going through. You, know, you can just see mine. My biggest three challenges are pain, health, and money. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? I mean, everyone's dealing with those. <laughs> Most of us at least have the ones of health and money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this um, it became crystal clear that there is no scale of happiness. Like, hey, you haven't dealt with anything, or you haven't had anything hard happen in your life, so you must be happy. You're not a 10. Or, oh, my gosh, this guy's in a wheelchair and a quad, so he probably won't ever be able to get above a 4. We think like that, but I have not found that to be true one bit. No. No, it isn't true. You know, I, 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 I keep saying what I learned was that life is what you think it is. Ooh, I like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so much of it is, and you know, it moves on as you as you talked about. Once we think it is something, then that's what we call forth, and then that's what we see. And uh, you know, we the the same person that was in your life being a a pain or a, a distraction or somebody you paid no attention to, all of a sudden becomes a person who's an ally, who's a, <coughs> a contributor. Um, a person that brings a resource, and um, I, I, I have just read a phrase that I like a lot, which said that everyone you meet knows something that you do not. Oh, my gosh. I think there's going to be a spot opening up on my stage for Jackie Peterson. <laughs> and I, you know, I've, I've been uh, playing that, you know, in my head and thinking, isn't that true, you know, and... That's a good reason to uh, pay attention and listen to absolutely everybody that you meet because everybody has something to teach you. And um, it's quite an amazing spot. So let's move on, though, and talk about your solopreneur business. You do, you're an inspirational speaker. And who's your audience? Who do you usually talk to? My audience is divided in half. The first half would be professional conferences. 
I love doing keynote speeches. That just it's a very uh, natural fit for my message. I speak to many different types of groups. Everything. I just did one for the Labor Relations Institute. I've gone into small businesses and spoke to their staff of fifty. Um, motivation, inspiration is really the core of what I do, and I've just started to offer in this last year uh, some additional breakout sessions to really focus on communication and bringing out that confidence in our uh, in our office to let down that emotional guard and really make that connection between employees and, and figure out how we are programmed to communicate and connect with each other and get to know each other on a whole different level. And then the second half of what I do is really geared at students. I have a program called Step Up Student Success. I've been doing this last year in schools where I go into uh, the school twice, so ideally once in the fall, once in the spring, and then have contact with the schools twice a month through an uh, e-newsletter that I send out with uh, lesson plans that you know, tie in with state standards, but also a Coach Jake video where students can send in their questions. I put on my ball cap, have the whistle, and become like that basketball coach you had in high school. It's a lot of fun. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really good. I love that, you know, as a, as a business model. I particularly love the work with students because there's a continuity attached to it. You know, um, it's so difficult to market when everything that you do is a one-off, you know, Mm -hmm. and you like selling to a professional conference. And then uh, if that conference uh, doesn't hire you again for next year, which is not likely with a keynote speaker, you know, they like to have a variety, then you've got to go, you know, kill another buffalo and drag it home. (laughs) And, you know, everything is, you know, a one and but if you are doing something like you're doing with students, with your step up with students, you do it in the spring. I mean, you do it in the fall, and then you do it again in the spring, and you have an ongoing, um, you know, a webinar. Coach Jake, see now that's a product, and that's something that you know has continuity. You could add schools to it. You know, you could uh, really build something from that. Oh, I, I just think that's wonderful. I'm really uh, excited about that product for you. That's a good Thank one. Thank you. My mentor has been uh, hammering me these last couple of years to do that, develop a speech or a program, and then go out there and sell it. One of the uh, my biggest sources of mission creep, which is probably my favorite takeaway from your Better, Smarter, Richard class, it was awesome, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, is that I'm always going out there and looking for a different buffalo. I'm always developing and tweaking and um, here's how naive I was at first. It was it was ridiculous. I mean, I started from square one in this business. The first time I wrote a school speech, it was 15 pages long, wrote out word for word, and when I was finally done with that, I closed my binder, put a huge smile on my face, and said, hey, well, I just did all the work. Now I'll be able to, the speech is great, I'll be able to do this forever. I'll never have to write another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a sick joke. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't actually read that speech to anybody, did you? Uh, yeah, about that one. My first speech was so bad. <laughs> and this is a message for all of our listeners who are wondering if they are good enough for comparing themselves to other people who seem to have it all and be the experts. We all started at the same spot. Yes. The first speech I did to Goofer High School, my alma mater, where I graduated with 24 kids. I rolled up in front of that audience, opened my binder, and read every single word for all 15 pages. It was huh. terrible. You probably can't hear me smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, it was so bad because I wanted to really give these students a look into what life is like as a quadriplegic. I wanted to leave them uh-huh. with a sense of perspective. So I spent yeah. like 40 minutes going, imagine not being able to open a Dorito bag. Imagine <laughs> having your mom dress you and go everywhere with you. Dun, dun, dun. I think like the last five minutes, I kind of smiled and said, hey, but I'm so happy and you should be too. <laughs> <laughs> Those kids were so scared. They didn't even want to walk down the bleachers to go back to class for fear of becoming like Jake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's great. I can I can tell we haven't talked for about a year, Jake, and I can tell 
just from the conversation and the things that you're bringing up, how, how much your business has progressed. And it's really fabulous. You have learned a lot and um, are obviously now a professional presenter and presenting yourself and your message in a different way. And you know uh, what to say and what to include and what to withhold and, you know, what to wait for questions about. Um, so I'd say good job. I know you've been working really hard on this. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you how do you go about marketing? Do you have an agent or a staff that helps you with a lot of that? Oh, my gosh. This is a little bit embarrassing. I am staff of one at the moment, which is myself. And this last month was the busiest month I've ever had with speeches. It was crazy. It was challenging. It was fun. And this coming month I have, like, two gigs. So I'm really going to focus on developing my promo materials, updating the website, creating a rock-solid marketing strategy so that way this summer I can really hit it hard for conferences uh, that are late summer and towards the fall and the winter uh, and, and just have a lot more. Um, I'm, I'm more clear about my message. You know, it took a long time to really draw out of myself what do I have to say? You know, what would I walk across a canyon to tell somebody? Mm -hmm. What would, they, what would they walk across the canyon to hear? Yeah, yeah, that was that was tough. At, at first, I wanted to tell them every little trick I had and how wonderful I was. And to be honest, the audience doesn't care about the person on stage. And that's not a slam. That's not anything negative about the audience. They want to know what's in it for me. I mean, why should I sit here for an hour and listen to you? And, and that took a lot of um, a lot of stage time. I'm a member of the National Speakers Association here in Oregon. We recently had a speaker just last month named Darren LaCroix, who was fabulous. And his mantra, he, he trained speakers, was uh, stage time, stage time, stage time. Yeah, I couldn't mm -hmm. agree more, not just for speakers, mm -hmm. for any solopreneur, whether you are a trainer or a coach. It's, it's easy for us to put things off and say, well, I'll make those calls when I, or I'll start doing this and coaching people as soon as this is developed. Get out there and try. <laughs> There's no yeah. better way to find out what works, what doesn't work, what you're good at, what you need to work on. Uh, there's no better way than actually doing it. Get whatever your yeah. stage looks like. Yeah, yeah. Get up there and go. Uh, experiential learning is, you know, the way I would say it. You know, adults do experiential learning, and we have to um, give ourselves experiences and then we have to process those experiences. What happened? What could I do better? Um, and those better things we want to integrate into everything that we're doing. What didn't work well? How do I make sure we don't ever do those again? And a lot of times people don't uh, process the experience in that way so that they kind of squeeze the learning out of it. You know, they just, they, they, they just don't do it. And... Um, you know, what happens if we don't learn it, we have to go redo it and learn it again. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. That's My mom is, is amazing in many ways. I'm so fortunate to have her basically as a business partner because I need a, a caregiver to travel with me everywhere. I mean, she yes. makes my life possible, and she's great for bouncing ideas off of or debriefing after a speech. But it is tough because as hard as it is for us to take any advice from our parents, even at 27 years old, I still feel like I'm seven. <laughs> she's saying, do this, don't do that. And just about everything she said has been right. And she's been yeah. hammering me for, for the longest of time. Watch your speeches on tape. Watch your yes. speeches. Oh, it's brutal. Yes. I would rather get up in front of 10,000 people in my underwear and give a speech than watch yes. myself on camera for 10 minutes. It is brutal. I do. I totally agree with you. I've just been creating these online classes myself, and it's brutal, you know. And uh, you, know, you think, oh, man. <laughs> there must be something wrong with the camera. I, I don't sound like that. <laughs> or look like that. Oh, my goodness. I, I sent an email to my producer and webmaster, and I said, who is that grumpy old woman that's on these shows? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you and I could probably retire. Why are you me up? <laughs> yeah. If we developed a filter that was like Instagram and a, and a camera we could put on there that makes us all look beautiful, <laughs> just for ourselves. It was very funny, and I was even laughing as I sent the email. So um, so does your mother do the one when you talk about updating your website and, 
you know, your stuff on your computer, is, is she the one that reaches in and, and helps? It doesn't sound uh, like sometimes she's a computer she does. operator. Pardon? A lot of times if I have to write a, a long email or a proposal or even a letter, um, we will do that together because my fingers don't work very well. And it's much quicker for her to type. Okay. Okay. And well, she's that's better good. with grammar than I am. Yeah. Yeah. So who's, who's your target client? Who are you going after? My target client would be meeting planners or meeting professionals okay. who are organizing a conference for an association or um, it could be for a particular company. And then the other half of my business, like I said, is in schools. And that is really hard because at every single school, it's different. One school, the principal might coordinate activities. The next school might have a SAD club, which is Students Against Destructive Decisions. It just presented to them last week. Or it mm-hmm. could be a leadership teacher. You just never know. And so there's a lot of kind of snooping around you have to do at schools, which is, is hard and what I'm looking at doing for next year, or not next year, just, just in the future in general, is learning how to present maybe to people at a district level or find larger companies that would sponsor me to do like a 25 school speaking tour. So I'm not spending so much time going, I mean, I put in twice as much time trying to find a person in a school as I do just hopping online and finding a meeting planner for an adult conference. Right. I, I think that's a really good idea for you to do that. And I, I particularly love the idea of finding a sponsor who would, you know, send you to a group of schools. And, of course, what you've got in your portfolio now is you've got quite a few schools that you've done work for. So, you know, it's not like who is this person going to take advantage of our poor students and, you know, our education system. But, you know, there's enough there that... You've got probably referrals and credibility and, you know, people can check you out. And, um, you know, but I think finding, you know, either a district or a uh, sponsor is a really good idea for you. Um, I was going to go about it totally wrong. I met mm. one of my absolute heroes named Chad Hymas, who also speaks from a chair. The man is a superhuman, literally. And I got to meet him a few months ago down in San Francisco at a conference. He's had many big sponsors um, come up to the plate and like he did every high school I think in the state of Utah last year or, or two years ago and I was just going to go up let's say to Nike and say hey I'm Jake France I've worked with these schools I know you do outreach you market to a lot of students how can we put together a package that would reach about tens of thousands of students and Chad said hold on Jake and this is a, a great point for all of us uh, whether we're trying to just get into a corporation to do work or coaching or training, you have to have that relationship because if they don't know who I am, he said, he said that I'll never approach someone for sponsorship who I have not developed a relationship with yet. So they haven't seen me speak a couple of times, gone out to lunch with me, or preferably had me work for their company a couple of times. Mm-hmm. 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 That's good advice. So you're going to begin doing that. Have begin to build some of those relationships with potential sponsors. I hope so. I mean, there's so many companies out there that market to students or have budgets set aside just for outreach or community uh-huh. development. And, and what a way to make a huge impact on students in a positive way. And if I spoke at a school and there was a thousand kids and you sponsored 25 of my speeches, I mean, right away you, you reached 25 times you know, 10,000 or times a thousand yeah. students. And, it's I can understand why, why uh, Chad, is that his name, is a hero of your yes. such really good advice. So is he one of your mentors that helps you? I'm developing that relationship. I'm taking yeah. his advice and, and staying in touch with him. Um, what he does is, is just knowing what he, the challenges he has to go through as a quad, he not only has a little less function than I do, he's a family man too. He speaks over 200 times a year all over the world. It's it, it's amazing, and I can't emphasize enough the power of going to those networking functions. That's part of the National Speakers Association. It's just, that's an example of one basically big networking function. Uh, he has helped redefine what is possible from a wheelchair and totally 
took it or taken a crowbar to my little mental box of what I can one day do, personally and professionally. Wow. That's great, because you're doing that for other people as well. You know, I mean, the real pay it forward here, you know. So how marvelous that he's doing that, and he's uh, uh, inspiring you, and you're doing it, and you're probably inspiring other people who you do not even know at this point, you know. Well, thank you. Uh, One one huge benefit, one of the many huge benefits I got out of taking your Better, Smarter, Richer class, we had, I think, four or five people in our our, Mm -hmm. uh, teleconference group, Right. We were all trying to do the same thing, and it was so amazing to see all these people just willing to bear their souls and give their honest feedback, share their tips. It's been so encouraging as a solopreneur. My experience so far hasn't been, hey, this is my pie. You know, Don't cut into my business. It's been, hey, where are you at, and how can I help you grow? Let's make a bigger pie. Yes, yes. I have found people again and again and again and again to be – uh, generous, uh, thoughtful, uh, on point, uh, willing to share personal experiences and personal advice, uh, really, really do help each other. You know, when we do the uh, in-person study groups, what happens is we wind up with a cohort and we do a, a booster shot every, oh, it's about every five weeks or so, and people who haven't met each other because they were in different cohorts show up and immediately you know, have resources for each other, ideas for each other, um, you know, thoughts about where they can market, uh, a book they should read, a, you know, a technique they should try, a, you know, a website to go to, a type of program to use, you know, and, and it's the same experience that you've had, that people are very interested in helping each other. It's, it's really one of the reasons why we're doing this solo pro radio, too, because, um, you know, when you're a solo, you're a solo, you're alone. And people feel, uh, can feel very isolated, uh, they can feel very lonely, and it's a way to tune in and hear how other people in the, with the same business model who could be in a totally different field than you are, are, you know, grappling with the same problems. Talk about a sense of validation, mm-hmm. listening to other people's successes, their failures, what they struggle with, what motivates them. That's yes. priceless to someone who is working on their own most of the time, you know, burning yeah. midnight oil all by themselves, writing a blog or developing material, and you feel like you're out in the middle of a desert. And even if you've spoken to a thousand people uh, that afternoon, yeah. you'll be doing so much of your work by yourself. and getting mm-hmm. that, uh, that feedback and confirmation that, hey, you're on the right path, you know, we're dealing with that too, oh, that's worth its weight in gold. It is, it is really valuable, and, you know, uh, people have the same issues about uh, struggling with their marketing, um, uh, struggling to polish their message so that it is spot on to exactly the right audience, you know, and and we talk a lot about how the right word makes a difference. You know, when I sent you the, the bio, you said not to call you a successful motivational speaker, but rather an inspirational speaker. I mean, the difference between those makes a difference in how you are perceived. And, you know, we, it takes us a while to find those things. And we're all struggling with that, you know. And who have we got except each other to help us out? So... Well, talk to me about the difference between inspirational and motivational. (laughs) I think of motivation as you should do this, Uh and I think of inspirational more as telling a story and there's something inside you of an invisible force that pulls you to do something. And when you leave out of it, you leave out of the room, you are just filled with a sense of, wow, I want to do this, not I should do this. In one well, better than the other. Can I paraphrase and say I like that motivational is you should do this kind of lecturing, but inspirational is you can do this. Mm-hmm. Possibility. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So it's more possibility oriented. And I like yeah. that. I really like that. So I'm glad you made that change in, in talking about yourself because you certainly are talking about people about all the possibilities that are available to them no matter where they are, who they are, what they're doing, and you're modeling that in your life about possibilities. 
you know, unlimited possibilities. And, uh, yeah, they really are. Mm-hmm. What, what a great story to tell. So um, you're beginning, are you beginning to move? It sounds like you're beginning to move some of your talks and your programs online. Are you kind of doing webinars and e-classes? I've participated in quite a few virtual meetings. I haven't done my own webinar yet. But I would really love to move that direction some someday because, as I mentioned, logistics are hard for me. Yeah. And how neat would it be to have the same amount of influence and impact and not have to worry about getting on a plane or, oh, my gosh, how am I going to sit for 10 hours today? Or, hey, this is the budget this meeting planner is working with. I hope they can afford a ticket for both my mom and myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you are right. correct. I should... I should uh, should take one step back. I am moving some of my content online. If you look up Coach Jake Game Plan on YouTube, I think I have seven or eight videos on there that are geared for teenagers, for students. They're part of my Step Up Student Success Program. So I am taking some things virtual. I think it's going to be perfect for you, and actually it's perfect for many of us solos because, uh, as you remember, one of the principles in, in Better, Smarter, Richer is that you've got to market every day. You know, it kind of keeps you in that mindset um, and doing that outreach and you're trying to reach audiences beyond your personal frame of reference and the web is so perfect to do that. And, you know, there's now all kinds of tools and ways to do it and it, it moves your marketing to um, making sure people, calling people to your website so that they can see the array of products that they offer um, but you move beyond the geography of reaching people in a local area or even people that you can fly to. You know, you can call together those uh, step-up programs that you do. You know, I can see them reaching out to students not just in the local area but across the country, you know. Have and, you had uh, a gentleman named Roger Corville on your show yet? No. He is the incoming president of our National Speakers Association chapter in Oregon, and he is all about, he's called the virtual presenter. And oh. he was absolutely great uh, at removing those psychological stigma and boundaries we have about, well, I can't charge as much if I'm online, or it's not worth as much. Uh, he is, oh, so he, teach, he's, he's awesome teaching people how to make a very good business virtually. Oh, that's fabulous. That's a good lead. That's a wonderful lead. We'd be very interested in talking about that. So um, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time. We've got about five minutes left. So you talk about that your number one issue is a uh, tip to whom people you speak and teach is to never lose sight of the facts. But you break that facts down. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Mm-hmm. And whether it's my journey to rebuild my life after this devastating spinal cord injury or you would like to make a ladder to climb out of the pity pit or a bridge so you don't even have to fall in it in the first place, I consider the facts, F-A-C-P-S, focus, attitude, choice, thanks, and smile to be the five most influential variables in our life that really control how we perceive the world, how we accept and deal with and respond to challenges that happen all around us every day. And when you look at how these five variables, focus, attitude, choice, thanks, and smile, how we can manipulate them, we can always control them. And that gives us the final say in whatever's going on around us. Oh, that's fabulous. So just keeping that in mind, in other words, feeling like you're in charge. You're in charge. So do you get, do you get feedback from people, you know, when you speak or... Uh, work with your uh, step-up program, and, you know, do you have feedback from students that say, this is how you impacted my life, and, you know, does that happen? Oh, like the feedback is my favorite part. Absolutely love it. <laughs> it All right. It's one of those, I, I, I'm shameless when it comes to feedback. It's one of those things where you're saying, stop it, stop it, but you're making motions with your arms. Like, come on, keep pouring it on me. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any of- stories you'd like to tell? Uh, sure. You know, I set up a, a Facebook page just for people who have been in my audiences. It's, uh, it's all, you know, the title of my book and uh, really the mantra of my life and even of this Facebook page is called Life Happens 
dash live it. And students and adults have hopped on there and just shared touching stories about their struggles and how they walked away with a, a newfound self-confidence and they're going to live this aspect of their life differently. It's just, ah, that is so heartwarming to know that social media has really become an outlet to help turn the worst thing that's ever happened to me into one of the best things because it can help other people. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm sure that that uh, feeds you by giving you energy to continue on when, uh, you know, when you have challenges with your own attitude and choice, you know. And, I mean, I think we have to make those choices to be in that positive attitude often every day, you know. And uh, that feedback really does help. Okay, I'm having impact here. I made a difference in someone's life, and now they're making a difference in mine. This is worthwhile what I'm doing. That's that's what we want to know. Sure, so, it's not for this. people. So I invite yeah. everyone to like that Life Happens Dash Live It Facebook page. And I will answer any questions you have. You're free to personal message me or write on the wall, tell me your story. I, I'm a resource. Use me. All right. All right, everybody, you heard that. Go to his page and like it. So um, hopefully after all of this, uh, it's a great conversation. I loved having you today. Just thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, I'm sure we have some listeners who want to work with you or maybe have a a connection for you or an opportunity for you to speak. Um, So do you want to share your contact information and, uh, you know, URL or phone number? How can we find you? So if you can think of a conference that hosts speakers or if your work has a staff development or a training day and you'd like to have me come in and help your team turn excuses into expectations, you can reach me at uh, jake at frenchinspires.com or you can always give me a call at 541-993-3359. Okay. Okay. Well, Jake, this has been absolutely fabulous, and um, I'm going to go like your website and, or your Facebook site and uh, make sure that we carry on from there. This has been a great conversation. Listeners, what fun. This has really been absolutely fabulous today, and I thank you for tuning in. Uh, next week I'm going to be um, off, and so we are going to uh, replay our uh, interview that we had earlier this Uh, spring uh, with the lady who wrote Plan B about starting your own business. I love that discussion. And the following week on June 19th, when I'll be back, we're going to talk to uh, Don Rocklin and learn some more about the power of becoming a a, a coach and a solopreneur and all the good things that can happen in your life since then. I want to remind you, this is Jackie B. Peterson. This is, I'm the author of Better, Smarter, Richer seven business principles for solo and creative entrepreneurs, and I can help you through my books and classes become more financially successful as a solopreneur. And I hope that you will tune in again to Solo Pro Radio next week. Have a great week between now and then, and we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>